Good job this morning, church. Woo! Glad you are here to our online crowd, our ever-growing in-person crowd. Welcome to Senior Sunday. Uh, this, hey, let's give that one a hand. There we go. This is a Sunday each and every year where we honor our graduating high school seniors. We are thrilled to do so. And let me give God a little bit of the credit this morning. Let me give him, boy, there's an understatement. Let me give him just a little bit of the credit. <laughs> let me give God all of the credit this morning. If I had my druthers, we would have, uh, and I'd like to address this sermon to our seniors. want them to hear something that as they launch out into the world is for them. And if I had my druthers, we'd be somewhere in the New Testament. Uh, don't let anybody look down on you because of your age. But because of the story, we're in the book of Daniel. I wouldn't have picked that. What's the book of Daniel about? Four teenagers that decide they're going to change the world. Boy, our God has got us right where he wants us. And he's got a word for you guys this morning. And let me speak to all the other folks in the room that might just be slightly out of their teenage years. That's all of you. He's got a word for you as well. Do not hear this message just for them. For anyone who wants to be about the business of changing their world, and in so doing then changing the world, God has a word for you this morning. Can I hear an amen? Amen. 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 I want you to hear this word this morning. If you've got your Bibles, be turning to the book of Daniel. In the story, that would be chapter 18, as we come across these four outstanding teenagers... It's a book about visions. We believe in visions at this church. Acts speaks about visions. The New Testament church believed in visions. And we have a vision that our graduating seniors and each and every member of this church would be about the business of being, making, and maturing disciples of Jesus Christ. As you're still finding Daniel and turning in your Bibles to our text God's word today. Let me lead us in a prayer. Almighty God, I pray that you would uh, speak. Father, use all of my weaknesses. If there are any strengths, Father, in this earthen vessel, uh, they are all because of you. Father, use those strengths. Father, whatever you do, I plead with you this morning, starting with my heart. And every heart in this room and every heart watching online, and everyone that will engage this lesson and through the web and days and a season to come, that, Father, your word would roll forth in a powerful manner, convict, encourage, change, and, Father, transform this world. It is in your Son's name we pray. Amen. Well, to set the context, Israel's epitaph has been written. It's over. It is a catastrophic scene. The northern ten tribes, they're long gone. Now the southern tribes have been carted off into exile. When I say catastrophic, the temple has been destroyed. You say, well, I guess in modern times it would be kind of like if our White House was leveled. Not even close. The temple was the place where followers of God, the nation of Israel, it's where they became human. Like, oh, no, 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 that happens at birth. No, no. That didn't happen at birth. It was after the first week where, well, Joseph and Mary, by example, would take a child and dedicate their child at the temple. That is when a person really became a person. There's no more temple. You can't even be human as a Jew in the culture that they're currently living in exile without the temple. You can't reckon holidays. You can't thank God for the harvest. You can't commune with him completely because the primary way to do that was through the temple. It's gone. Well, I can live in a good community. If things go south and you get awkward, you can't reconcile with anyone because those offerings, those sacrifices of fellowship were to be done at the temple. They could not function at any level in the way that they had known to do so without their old world around them. And here they are living in Babylon. The holy objects of the temple sit in a pagan temple. 
as they crane their necks on a 900-mile death march, the original Trail of Tears. 900 miles, what would that be? That's you leaving right now on a walk from here, not to Chattanooga, but to Charlotte. When your feet hit the Atlantic Ocean, stop. And then after that walk, you'll have an idea of what it was to go into exile, knowing the whole time as you crane your neck backwards, you could see or then in your imagination the smoldering wreckage of what you used to call home and holy. To say it is a catastrophic scene is to put it mildly. And I thought the question of Daniel was this, and the point of Daniel was this. How do you exist, now in Babylon, how do you exist in an excessive, off-the-rails culture in a way that you're not being polluted by the culture? And there's something to be said about that in the book of Daniel. But that's not the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel is not how to exist in an excessive culture and not get polluted. I'll just be defensive all the time. The book of Daniel is, seniors get this, because this is a world you're headed out into. Not how to exist. How do you live and thrive in a culture that does not honor God, but yet you have decided to do so? And not only are you going to honor God in a way that thrives in a culture that doesn't honor God, you're going to do it gracefully with wisdom and tact. The church, hear me, about, hear me on this one. This is a message our graduating seniors need, but it is a message we all need, amen? Because last time I checked, I woke up and I said, where did my world go and it didn't get permission from me? <laughs> our culture has changed. Well, I just want to be angry all the time and not be polluted by it. That's not biblical. How do you live and thrive in a culture that doesn't honor God, and yet you do so every day by the power of God, in a way that isn't a, well, give me Facebook and I'll be a keyboard warrior again and slam everybody. No, you do it gracefully. And you do it in a way that's transforming and actually encourages those around you. Is that in the Bible? That's called the book of Daniel. And let's get there now. Point one, it's the dilemma we face as a disciple. The book of Daniel begins with the dilemma we face as a disciple. It doesn't begin with an all-out frontal assault on your faith. Give up God. That's not the book of Daniel. It's taste this. Let's change the menu of your meal just a little bit. Now, mind you, God's word said to partake of these things. No, 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 no. You can still partake of those things, but just add this. What is that all about? The book of Daniel begins with feast on a diet of the current culture. And the question is, will we as followers of God compromise and do so? This is a dilemma we face as disciples. There has been a lot said about compromise thus far in the story, in the Bible. And the Bible says there's a lot at stake. Adam and Eve compromised. They lost paradise. A guy named Abraham compromised. He almost lost his marriage. A guy named Esau compromised. He lost his birthright. A guy named Samson compromised. He lost his strength. A guy named David compromised. He lost a child. His son Solomon compromised. He lost the kingdom. The dilemma we face as disciples is are we going to compromise? Point two this morning on that handout on the backs of sermon outline. In the face of that dilemma, there is a decision we need to make as disciples. Daniel 1 and 8 gets at it in short order. Feast on a diet of culture. Compromise just a little bit. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food or wine. Daniel decided, the King James says, he purposed in his heart. And the vernacular is, I ain't going there. I am not going to compromise. The other day, I saw a quote that led me to this conclusion. Let me give you a quick synopsis. It's more than a quote, but an entire way of thinking. 
If you are well adjusted to a society that is not well adjusted, you're not well adjusted. Does that make sense? If you are well adjusted to a society and a culture that is not well adjusted to God, then you're not well adjusted. You were created and called to live like Him. That's what Romans 12 and 2, which was read earlier by Justin, gets at. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking, seniors, and everybody else with an earshot. Instead, fix your attention on God. And that's what Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego do. You can always justify your disobedience. You can compromise your principles. You can at every turn take the easy way out and not follow God's way. You can pad the expense account. You can stay up late on the internet visiting sites that you should not view at all. You can do things in secret. You can cut corners. You can compromise. Daniel made a decision that all disciples need to make. He resolved not to defile himself in the dilemma he faced in the current culture. Now, what does Daniel do from there? Daniel being placed in this position. Notice what Scripture does not say he does. Daniel is so dismayed. He is so disheartened. The other three teenagers, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, are so at a loss of what has happened around them and the culture they find themselves in, they grow bitter and angry. So dismayed, so disenchanted, so disheartened that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Daniel stayed up all night long making signs to begin to protest the culture. They began to get on Facebook and pout. They held grudges for the rest of their lives. They were angry at everyone that didn't think like them. Well, Mitch, the society really wasn't that bad in Babylon. In the book of Revelation, when the church is undergoing horrendous persecution, does John the Apostle through the Holy Spirit liken the Roman culture, thinking of the worst culture he could go to in Revelation 18? Is it titled The Fall of Egypt? John goes, when it comes to the worst culture I can think of, and when you're being persecuted in a way where you don't fit in at all, I'm going to title this chapter The Fall of Babylon. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in that devil's den decide not to get bitter, not to get angry, not to pout and hold grudges, not to pray every day, though there is a place for this, and there is a place for a righteous anger. But in the book of Daniel, that is balanced with the people who do not pray, Lord, just transport me off this rock. Instead, four teenagers say, God worked through me to transform this rock. And they began to see a vision of a rock descending that would shatter kingdoms. And that rock would grow and grow and was the kingdom of God itself. How are you about that business? Point number three this morning. Let's note the diplomacy we are called to show as disciples. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego not only know what to do in acting as God's ambassadors, as his diplomats, they know how to do it with grace tact and favor you know that word diplomacy noting the diplomacy that we are to embody and carry out as a disciple of God that word diplomacy is a French word from the middle ages a, 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 dip, a diplomat one who operated in diplomacy had a folded sheet of paper with a seal upon it from a sovereign and the diplomat operating in wisdom, tact, and favor, and privilege of a sovereign that sent them went with that folded sheet of paper and said, this is the king's message. He not only delivered the message of the what, but also the how. 
You know what the French began to refer to that folded sheet of paper as? A diploma? A diploma. Any of you guys get a diploma lately? You have been given a privilege. Paul would say this, you have been given a diploma. 2 Corinthians 3 and 2, you are that letter. Church, we haven't been given a diploma of privilege, favor, and tact. You are the letter from God. Well, I just want to be angry and bitter and I've been done wrong. And mm, and the world says, we got enough of that. <laughs> and again, there is a place for a righteous anger. A guy named Jesus one time had a redoing ceremony in the temple one time when he was angry in a righteous manner and he did not sin. But in the midst of that, there is also a tension where in Babylon, we as diplomats... The English word for that French term is, is ambassadors are the living letter of God on what to do and how to do it and when to do it. That is called wisdom and tact. I'm mindful of the young man, teenager, so left brain, so logical, he was about to tip over to his left side. Everything, follower of God, had to have a book, chapter, and verse. He couldn't move forward in life. He couldn't have a a coney dog unless there was book chapter and verse i mean he couldn't start a lemonade stand as a kid without book chapter and verse and so one day in his later teenage years he, he really began to get sweet on this young lady and i mean every date he'd walk her up to that door he'd drop her off he wanted to do nothing more than just to reach out and for the first time ever give her a little kiss on the cheek but book, chapter, verse, he just couldn't get there. First Peter 5, 14, greet one another with a holy kiss. This wasn't quite the holy kiss he intended. It wasn't a greeting. It was more of a bid you farewell and good night. And finally, he walks up to that door for about the fifth time, and she grabs him by both ears, pulls him close, and plants a big one right on his lips. And he goes, book, chapter, verse. She goes, Matthew 7 and 12, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Your neighbors, your neighbors are screaming for the wisdom and tact and love of Jesus Christ. In the presence of Pharisees who were planning to kill him, he was gracious and kind. Judas, who had betrayed him, he washed his feet in John 13. His love, his wisdom, his tact, his words... Those who don't follow Christ say he's the greatest teacher, one of the greatest people who, if not the greatest person, who has ever lived. And those are those that don't believe in him. We are called to be the letters that not only say how to live, but to get to the nature of what it is to follow after Christ in style, in atmosphere. Daniel 2 and 14 says this, when Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men, that would be Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel, Daniel spoke to him in a very abusive, caustic, language-filled way and complained. Well, you've come to kill me. Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. He was the diploma, the letter of God. Seniors and everybody else, let me give you two key characteristics of being a diplomat. Of having the style, if I can say it that way, of Christ. Number one, get this one. As you go forth from here for the rest of your lives and today, number one, have a heart full of thanksgiving. Daniel 6 and 10 says this. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published to put him to death, he went to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed. Whoa, 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 whoa. An edict has just been issued for your death. You're looking towards the smoldering remains of what used to be your home. And not once, not twice, but three times a day, Daniel got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to God just as he had done before. Man, what a heart. 
You cannot be an ambassador for God and be diplomatic and let people know what God's life in you is like if you don't have a heart of gratitude. Last night I had the privilege of meeting with an old roommate from college, ESPN analyst this week for the PGA. As we sat down, I began to ask this friend of mine, in the past 30 years, what's one of the greatest lessons you've learned? Spiritual giant, in my, my opinion. He says, well, Mitch, you know, I've made my home in Abilene. They've got an airport, if you can believe that. And I, I can get anywhere in the nation. The cost of living there is low. That's where we made our home after graduation. And I can be in L.A., I can be in Atlanta, and I can be here in Tulsa at a moment's notice. And, well, right now, there's the mesquite fire burning in Abilene. 10,000 acres have gone up. My home was in jeopardy. I told the ESPN guys, I may have to cut out of here and I can't do one thing for you. They said, hey, if you got to go home and protect your wife and your kids and go. And he said, you know, it's been my custom every day I get up and I thank God for a home. And as my neighbors, two of them, have lost their homes in that fire, it has been impressed upon me more and more to be thankful and err on the side of gratitude in everything I do. How are we going to be a people that have a heart full of thanksgiving. And number two, a key way to live out Christ, have a mind full of Scripture. Daniel 9 and 2. In the first year of Darius's reign, I, Daniel, understood from the Scriptures, capital S. We're talking about Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy here in the Old Testament. He's reading the Torah. I understood from the scriptures according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah. I'd always read that passage that he was reading Jeremiah. You couldn't get Jeremiah yet. Jeremiah, the ink wasn't dry on that scroll yet. He's listening to this relatively new preacher preach from old passages. So you got the old word of God that the foundation can be built on, but it's coming through fresh revelation. These two are contemporaries. How are we going to be people that fill our hearts with thanksgiving and fill our mind with scriptures? Number four, that leads us to the deliverance we experience as disciples. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego learned that deliverance is not always from the fire, but can be through the fire. The first, being delivered from the fire, will build your faith. Being delivered through the fire will refine and perfect your faith. Biblical faith is not confidence in my presumed outcome, but faith in the person and plan of God. And church, sometimes that's hard. Because I believe my presumed outcome, what I'm praying for, will be best. But I ultimately know trusting in the person and plan of God, that's the best. Amen, church? And that is the deliverance of God. There are times where it looks very different than the deliverance we plan for. But make no mistake, when you trust in God as a deliverer, ultimately you will not be disappointed. There may be days where you're going, I don't see where this is going. The fire is still there, and last time I checked, they're warming it up some more. But there is a friend in the fire that will meet you there. The lion's den may still come, but the deliverer will see you through. Over and over again, those who trust in the Lord, find their hope in the Lord and their future in Him. Which leads us finally to number five. Seniors, if you don't hear anything else, hear this. The danger we must avoid as disciples. Babylon was a pretty impressive place. Two city walls. The outer one, 38 feet high. Four stories. Well, how wide was it? I guess you can build anything that's four stories tall if it's thin enough. It was thick enough, the outer wall, that four chariots going abreast at the same time could drive around the top. That's as wide as a stage, and even more so. 38 feet high, 100 gates. Jerusalem had nine. It wasn't a little bit better than what the Jewish people had seen. It was infinitely better. You ever heard about the Hanging Gardens of Babylon? This is where they were. Nebuchadnezzar's palace, 200,000 square feet. The ruins, you can see them today. A massive palace, one of three. Babylon was an impressive place, but there's a danger. Danger in this story. Daniel 4 and 29 says this. 
One day, King Nebuchadnezzar, as he was walking around the rooftop of the royal palace, he said, Oh, is not this the great Babylon I have built? By my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty, the words were still on his lips when God brought the boom down. Moments later, Nebuchadnezzar was feasting on grass as a wild animal out in the field had lost his mind. Now, church, seniors, I want you to get this one. Now, I'm going to be a little bit facetious here, and I'm going to make a little bit of a point here that you can go too far with, but I want you to get the point. Could I do my rendition real quick, please indulge me, of God the Father? Oh, man, Nebuchadnezzar knocked down the temple. Mm. Oh, man, he knocked down the walls of Jerusalem to get to the temple he knocked down. Killed a lot of my people. He took the objects of the temple. He's now drinking out of them, hosting a cocktail party. 900 miles, he took my people. A lot of babies died on the way. He said, what? He said he built that place under his power to his majesty. It's go time. Now, I went too far with that. God cares about everything that transpired there. But notice when Nebuchadnezzar does all those things, God does this. Watch this on pride, guys. Nebuchadnezzar said he built it, and God goes, game on. God hates pride. He hates it. It's what started everything on the wrong course. It's what brought the devil into being from an angelic creation of God. It is at the core of every sin. There are more people in hell today from pride than all the false religions combined. Pride prevents salvation. It quits on worship. You won't say you're sorry if you're prideful. You won't tell somebody you love them if you're prideful. So salvation will not be found by the prideful person because pride never bends a knee. Pride kills prayer, Psalm 10 and 4. The prideful are the wicked who do not pray. Why would you pray? You don't need him. You don't need him. You got this. That's in your pride. So let me ask you this question. Nebuchadnezzar did that from his rooftop. Boy, I did all this. My question to you this morning is, where's your rooftop? We've all got access to a rooftop. We've all had a rooftop. Is it your money? Is it your job? Is it your relationship? Is it your children? Is it the college you're going to? Is it your GPA? Is it your athletic ability? What are you prideful about? And here's the good news. As much as God hates pride because of what it does to his people, he loves, he loves humility. The Bible says all of you clothe yourselves in humility because God, I oppose the proud, but I give grace and favor to the humble. Daniel 4 and 26 says this. Now, wait, let, let me get this straight. H hang on, we're going to do a little, little bit deeper than I had planned. That last passage I shared with you, where God jumps up out of his seat and says, Nebuchadnezzar said what? That's Daniel 4 and 29 through 31. Okay, go ahead and bring up the next scripture. Well, Mitch, this is Daniel 4 and 26. Before Nebuchadnezzar goes off the rails, God already lays a plan for his restoration in place. That's a gracious God. This is not a God who goes, well, you messed up. I didn't see this one coming. I guess I better do something so you can get your way back to me. God, before we ever go off the rails, says, let me tell you how this thing can be right again. Man, that's a loving Lord. He knows we're going to mess up. He knows 
where you are right now, and he knew at some level that you were going to be there. That's way over my pay grade. (laughs) But he knows also that he wants you home. So Daniel 4 and 26 reads this way. Hey, Nebuchadnezzar, your kingdom will be restored to you when? Step one, you might want to write these down. If you've ever had a friend go off the rails, here's the steps to come back. Here's how to take hold of humility and let pride go. Step one, acknowledge that heaven rules. Acknowledge that heaven rules. Mitch, what does that mean? It means I don't rule. And a lot of times I live my life accordingly that I rule things. It means I don't rule and heaven rules. Step one, acknowledge that. Step two, renounce your sins. Be done with them. I don't want to live this way anymore. We talked about this last week. Stop going that way. Start going this way. Reconnect with him. Well, how do I renounce my sins? Oh, I just renounce it. No, the Bible goes deeper. Renounce your sins by doing right, good behavior, following after him, and by being kind to the oppressed. Man. Well, what does that have to do with anything about getting things right again? It has to do with having a humble heart. You find a person in your life that's being oppressed right now, and your challenge this week is to be kind to them. Maybe you have actually been the oppressor. Maybe your life has brought oppression to someone you even love. Well, I'm going to acknowledge that heaven rules and I stop ruling. I want to renounce my sins by doing what is right. And God says, flat out, just be kind to people especially those who are oppressed or those by my actions I have oppressed. It doesn't say tolerate them. It doesn't say put up with them. It doesn't say deal with them. It says actively be kind to them. Back to Matthew 7 and 12. Do unto others as you would have done unto you. So this past Sunday, church is over. I'm at the house. might have been Monday. My days get mixed up and My uncle sends me a text. He's 80 years old, my Uncle Bob, and the text says, he's gone. I don't don't know what he meant. Uncle Bob, who's gone? Stephen's gone. Massive heart attack. His son dies. Mitch, would you come do the funeral? So Thursday, I get in the car, drive down to Quitman, and I stand there and I watch my uncle, who I've never seen cry, look into a coffin and see his son. That's not the way this is supposed to go. Parents aren't supposed to look at their kids in a coffin. And I I preach the funeral, and I'm standing at the head of the casket, and I look over, and everybody's gone out of the room, and this man who I've never seen cry begins to weep. And he looks at me, and he'd done a good job as a father. But even in that, he looked at me as he shook my hand. He said, Mitch... You tell those kids that you love them. You tell those kids and those grandkids that you love them. You know what Uncle Bob was saying? Operate in wisdom and tact. Know what to do and how to do it. And today is the day you take advantage of that. I wonder who in your life is spiritually, emotionally, especially after these last two years, is almost, I mean, they feel dead. And today, God operating through you, you take the challenge to go up and speak life into them. Today, you may want to come forward. It's a big room, but we have people that come forward every Sunday. We don't have to share it from the stage. If you want an elder, if you want an elder and their wife to pray over you right now, they'll do that and we'll leave it right there. If you want the whole church to pray over you, if you want to acknowledge that heaven reigns, renounce your sins by committing to follow after him if you want to say i just want to be someone today have the church pray for me because i want to start being kind to people in a harsh world would you come now as we stand and as we sing